Good morning and welcome to this week. Scott, 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 how are you? Well, uh, I'm doing okay, but it's a, it's a dark day. Um, or, uh, I mean, with the, the, the murder of, of George Floyd in Minneapolis, um, and I mean, what we can say for the, you know, on the positive side that it is, it is sparking, you know, a nationwide movement of, of protests. Uh, yes, yes, it is, and um, and we can be glad uh, about that. Uh, people are not just going to take getting killed routinely over and over and over and over again. You just had this spate, you know, um, and it like comes in waves, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, and and what's the reason for it? Because the administration in Washington under Mr. Trump has fueled the flames of racism and division and racist violence. Did you hear what the son of a blankety blank said last night? He said, if you don't start stop looting, we're gonna start shooting. Oh. That's what Trump said, you know, and uh, you know, nobody supports uh, setting things on uh, fire and breaking windows and all of that kind of thing. But also that's, uh, not, that's not the point. Right? Though I do understand the, 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 the anger that gives rise to people breaking windows and, you know. Uh, and there's a discussion I had with, fire to, uh, I was having a discussion on Facebook this morning with some friends. You say uh, what? I was having a discussion on Facebook with some friends who were saying, oh yeah, no, it's so uh, tragic, the, the murder of George Floyd, but that's no excuse for looting and rioting. But you know, the, the, the point is that, that police kill 1,100 people a year, more or less. It's, it's been pretty constant over the past few years, right around 1,100. Um, and disproportionately black people and often unarmed black people um, and the the you know targeting the relatively isolated acts of, of vandalism or, or or whatever um is a is a deflection from the actual systemic problem of of white supremacist violence committed by officials of the state um and you know until you know until until people are there on the front lines fighting against white supremacy, you know, pointing the finger at, at, at looting and, and breaking windows and lighting fires is, I think, a deflection anyway. There's a slow moving riot going on in our communities for the last 40 or 50 years. You know, it's a riot of joblessness. It's a riot of homelessness. It's a riot of uh, drug infestation. You know what I'm saying? It's a, a uh, and then it flares up when when people are routinely uh, killed over and over and over again. And 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 again, you know, it is uh, due to a um, championing of racist uh, ideology and practice, using it as a central organizing principle uh, for this administration. And by the way, it wasn't the first time that. Trump talked about shooting people. And he did it on the border, if you remember, a couple yeah. of years ago. And, uh, and well, he also, you, know, he you, also can shoot Mexican, about, you can shoot black people, it don't matter. And he also talked about sending um, uh, sending the military into Chicago um, to, to clean up the gun violence problem, um, right? He's, that, that's, his, that's his solution. And, and, and therefore, you know, we need to focus on a, a building and continuing to build because it's building, you know, a mass movement against this racist police violence. And, and the first demand of such a movement is community uh, control of the police. You have to set up civilian control boards uh, to regulate what's going on because, and then, you know, you got you need radical reforms of the of the uh, police departments. You know, because you got all these uh, Ku Kluxes and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, neo Nazi type. I saw a picture. I don't know if it was real or not, 
of that cop, the murder, the murder cop, uh, with Trump um, at a rally. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, so you need to, to rid these elements. You need to get get rid of them, um, and uh, and uh, retrain. You know, um, and that's one of the the you know ridiculous things about the situation we're in, right? We have this massive, lavishly funded intelligence apparatus that can gather information on anyone, anywhere, for any reason, tap your phone, whatever, but for some reason seems incapable, actually unwilling, uh, to um, get ne actual neo-Nazis and KKK members out of police forces. Right. That's because the KKK is running the intelligence services. They know what's they going do. on. I mean, come on, it's like the fox guarding the chicken, the chicken coop, you know? And and therefore, you know, um, we can't rest until uh, these issues are addressed. The people are rising up, you see. I wanted to go back to what you said about the, you know, the rise of the fascist danger, because um, you know, we talk about police murder. The other way of thinking of it is police execution, right? This man was executed on suspicion of having passed a counterfeit $20 bill. He was killed by an agent of the state without a trial, without um, ever having had charges pressed against him on suspicion. And that it looks to me like Trump's whole kind of position on democracy, that our democratic rights, and especially the democratic rights of people of color, uh, are contingent on his whims, right? He can decide when, who gets to vote and who doesn't, when Congress can exercise oversight and when it can't. Uh, and, and it's the same situation where you have police officers deciding when uh, due process rights, when Miranda rights, when um, basic you know, human rights apply and when they don't. Right? Well, who was it? The Justice Taney who said that a black man ain't got no rights, that a white man is bound to respect? And, that, and that's still- this is, this, is, this is the case with, with respect to the uh, uh, capitalist state, um, particularly as it is dominated by the extreme right, and which is another reason why the first step in um, uh, getting rid of them, what do you call it? A strategic defeat of the right? Is a decisive defeat of the How's that article coming, by the way? Uh, it's coming, it's coming. Um, the, the old is dying, the new struggles to be born now is a time of monsters. The article will come to birth soon, uh, hopefully. But the, the decisive defeat of the far right, it's not, it's not just winning a legislative majority at the federal level, uh, you know, breaking the Republican stranglehold on states. Uh, it has to do with what you, those victories are part of it, but it has to do with what you, what you do with them. You have to be able to um, move against the, the perpetrators of this kind of violence. You have to be able to dismantle the the kind of political apparatus of the extreme right. So that means civilian control of police. Um, that means um, using the Justice Department to um, pursue uh, white supremacist elements within police forces. That means, um, you know, at something like um, making a, a felony offense of, of voter suppression and actually prosecuting people who attempt to disenfranchise people. Though those are the things that the use, thinking of it in terms of reconstruction, something like the use of state power to advance and, and protect democratic rights. Um, and the first step is to arrest them, 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 uh, a fascist who killed their brother. Yes. They need to be uh, arrested and arrested now, you know, and they need to, to, to stop screwing around because it's routinely done. And the thing about it is that it's so outrageous. You know, you can do it on video, you can capture it, you can see it, whether it's a cop or if it's a vigilante. And nine out of 10 times, they're not convicted. They're not they're exonerated. And they go on about doing their business. 
any way they uh, uh, want to do. And, and uh, you know, the police departments and the state, they have repositories of, of, of the right wing anyway, you know? And, they and by the way, the National Guard is not the solution to the problem. No, no. You know, I remember when I was a child of, uh, what was I was, uh, 1967, I was 10. Martin was killed and there was a little disturbance in my hometown in Youngstown. You know, uh, a couple of windows got broke. They called in the National Guard. There were tanks in the schoolyard where I went. Armed personnel carriers, soldiers with automatic weapons. I'll never forget it. And I remember my older brother, we went up to the playground, you know, and my older brother saw us up there. <laughs> Carl, he came and may he rest in peace. And he dragged me get the fuck off of the, excuse my language, that tank. Yeah. And he drug me home and he showed me some pictures of children who had been napalmed uh, in Vietnam. He said, these are the same people who are napalming these kids, you know? Yeah. And that's- I'll never forget it. I'll never and forget it. We, we have to recognize the greatest, the, the, the threat to our safety and security and way of life is not protesters demanding justice. It's it's the state that routinely uses just incredible amounts of violence to um, achieve its ends, to achieve the, the continued power of, of the capitalist class. And yeah, that, that until we can fight against that, figure out who our actual enemies are, this isn't gonna end. The main drag in Youngstown, at least on the south side, was Hillman, Hillman Street. And when those windows got broke in 68, that's, uh, Martin was killed in 68, not 67. Um, that was the end of Hillman Street. That was the beginning of the deteriorate day. The business is left. And you go there now, uh, Scott, the only thing standing is a church, New Bethel Baptist Church. You know, you got four miles of yeah. emptiness. Wow. There used to be a robust, thriving community. And it began in 68 with the breaking of a window to protest Martins. And the same thing happened in DC on 8th Street, Northwest, you know? Um, and um, now I think it's built up, but for years, you know, it was just a disaster zone. How segregated, That's what they do. How segregated was Youngstown in terms Very. of- very, 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 it didn't start that way, but uh, it was very, very segregated. It, it, it still is. Um, it may be a little bit more integrated residentially now, curiously, because um, most of the so-called inner city is gone, but the outskirts and the suburbs now are more integrated. But social life is completely segregated. They're black bars and their white bars, you know? Was that even the churches and their white churches, you know? Black graveyards, white graveyards. Was that even the case in, in sort of steel worker neighborhoods? Say what? Was it, was it, it would seem like when you had, you know, um, black and, and white folks working together in mills in the same union, there would be some sort of impetus to at least a, a shared social life to a degree. There was a shared economic life and a political life uh, in, the, in the unions mm -hmm. and in, um, and in uh, the um, uh, uh, certain dimensions of broader city and county politics. Uh, but no, when, when people went home, they went to Okay. South side, they went to the east side of Youngstown, the black people. White folks went to the west side, you know, or to the far north side, or they went to the suburbs. That's, that's the way that that uh, went uh, uh, down. And um, uh, because of, don't forget that, you know, my mom and dad met at a struggle to desegregate the swimming pools. Mm -hmm. They were segregated 10 years before I was born. And um, so imagine, you know, a decade later, that ideology which resulted in, the, you can't swim together. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, neither could you, you know, go to a bar together. Or, or that, even though the legal, the de jure segregation was was, was, a, was ended, was, was gone. The de facto was uh, uh, still, 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 and, and and racism is that's still a factor in most of the country. It's a little bit different in New York or in the Bay Area, you know. But uh, in, in most of the country, those, those patterns mm -hmm. still largely um, manifest themselves, which is why we have to dismantle uh, uh, racism and racist institutions in the economy, in the criminal justice system, you know, in housing, in healthcare, in every... And some good things are happening, you know, like some cities are, decla are declaring as a result of the uh, 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 pandemic, uh, Pittsburgh declared right. racism uh, public the city. Health crisis. Huh? They said uh, racism is a public health crisis. Right? It's a public health emergency. Yes, yeah. so that's an important. That's an important, and, and several others are as as have done so as well. But then the question becomes, what's the next step? What do you do? Yeah, and the new administration that is elected and the new Congress, you know, uh, in these circumstances, you need, you know, this is uh, why we need uh, to really begin thinking about what kind of program is going to be and platform is going to be necessary to address this crisis in the country. And, you, and know, you know, I was thinking yesterday morning, what it, what it you know what it means to be a white working class person in a country so kind of deeply twisted by by white supremacy and it's you know the party has there's an old party post that says racism chains both right uh, which you know which means that the you know black people bear the heaviest and the most vicious burden of it but it also holds it holds all of us back because as long as we stay trapped in the system of white supremacy, the best white workers can hope for is to be a little better off, you know, than black people. And a little better off is not good enough when the bottom is falling out and everybody is, um, it's inhuman in the first place and it's unequal and it's unfair, but, you know, we're, we're capable of, some, of so much more of, of not just being better off, but a, a, a society based on real equality and real human dignity and um, what we deserve, not how little we can accept. But before that can happen, we have to break out of this trap of, of white supremacy. That's like the, the first condition for, you know, working for a society of real dignity for everybody. Yes, you're right. And we got to add Native Americans uh, in terms of the severity of oppression and Latinos and Asians to the picture that uh, the black white dynamic has changed as the society has grown more multiracial and multinational uh, over the course of the uh, years, uh, which is a big impetus for the growing unity of the country, you know, but it's also a, uh, a flag in the hands of the white supremacists who, who think that, oh, the good old days are gone. The country's being overrun by um, uh, people as if we're a threat to uh, uh, their quote unquote identity, which is a false identity from an identity imposed on them in order to justify slavery in the first place. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, that has to be uh, addressed as well you know, um, and the material, quote unquote, material benefit, of, that too is a illusion for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because when the economy is pulled from under you, the class, everybody falls, you know, some of us fall harder, but in a certain way, we're more used to it. I know that when the mills closed in Youngstown, um, you could just see black people were accustomed to being poor, so we kind of knew how to survive. But the white workers, they were, <laughs> I, 
I mean, this is sub subjective on my part. <laughs> I always felt like they had a much harder time yeah. coping with, with, with what happened than, than, than uh, we uh, did. But the lesson in Youngstown and then Gary and in Chicago and in Detroit was that when the industry closed, everybody lost. Everybody lost and lost big time. The drug rate, the addiction rate, the suicide rate, you know, the child abuse rate, the, the, the domestic violence against women, everything, you know, just went, just escalated uh, dramatically. And these social crises that we have been living under for the last 40, 50 years, you know, now are, uh, you know, it's a crescendo of them. And um, uh, we, we, we uh, and this is what the, the social movement against the Trump neo-fascists uh, has to give life to, you know, um, in this period. Um, and in fact, we need a national march on Washington this summer, protesting yeah. police violence. You know, uh, I don't know how we can do it safely uh, in, in this pandemic, but that's what's needed. And by the way, this needs to be a slogan on Wednesday, the AFL-CIO is organizing a national caravan of cars, uh, workers first. And one of the things that workers first meet and police violence against workers, black yeah. workers, brown workers, Asian workers, white workers. Yeah. You know, because, um, that has to be uh, at one of, you know, we, so I hope if people are going, if you're going to make signs, that's one of the signs you should make. Another sign, unemployment compensation. Yeah. It's going to end on July the, uh, 31st, the HEROES Act that was passed by the House has unemployment compensation extended to the end of the year. That needs to be up front and center at the top of the list of the demand. And, and this and unemployment, the, the, the threat of, of losing unemployment benefits isn't just, you know, that that's the loss of benefits is part of it. And the, the leverage it gives bosses over workers is, is another part of it. Um, I was talking to somebody who uh, had her hours cut back to half time, mm. so would have been eligible for unemployment. But her boss told her, uh, "Don't don't sign up for unemployment because if you do, um, the you're going to be they're going to offer you another job full time in a different you know department of the hospital, not the one where you've worked for 15 years, where you know everybody, where you know how to do it. Mm. They're going to try to." You know, force you into this other thing. So, you know, she ended up just living on a on a half salary rather than, you know, and this this happens all, all the time. Like the 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 threat of the loss of unemployment is used to um, force people back to work despite unsafe conditions. Or it, it it's certainly yeah. Anyway, <laughs> people need to rise up and protest this stuff. We need to organize the unemployed. We need to. Organize our neighbors, our co-workers. So we're gonna take a fight to 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 push this stuff mm -hmm. back, you know. And and uh, and by the way, we support the, the the uprising of the people that's taking place now, the right to protest, and uh, we encourage everybody to uh, do it in a militant and safe way. I think that that does it, Scott. We've been at it for a while. Yeah. Any parting shots? I was just gonna say, you know, never never fall into the trap of thinking that you're worth what the capitalist class tells you you're worth. Fight for what you deserve, fight for your dignity, fight for um, a better world, not, not just you know being a little better than someone else, a little better off than someone else. Um, fight for your right to breathe. Yeah. Free. Take the, uh, all right, Cascat, take care. And uh, we will see everybody uh, next week, same time, uh, same station. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you later, Joe. All right.